This is a weekly Chimpers production, which takes place every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So you can put that right into your calendars if you don't know already. My name is Bicek. I'm your host. For today, I'm, of course, joined by the epic founding team of Chimpers, uh, one of which is Timpers, of course. He has designed a PO app for today, which you can claim at the end of the show. So stay tuned until the end to get hold of one. It includes our special guest today and will get you entered into a raffle for some Chimpers NFTs at the end of season two in March. Before I introduce our special guest today, just a quick shout out to our sponsor for season two, Seedworld. Seedworld, created by Seedify Studios, represents a new era in the metaverse landscape. The platform will be fully centered around user-generated content, offering a unique blend of creative freedom and digital innovation. Seedworld invites users to explore and shape a virtual world that values decentralization and personal expression. More from Seedworld a little later. But now to our special guest today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome them to the stage with us. It is, of course, co-founder of Nifty Island, the island where all the Web3 communities are going to play. Our special guest today is Charles. Welcome, Charles. How are you doing? And are you ready for some chimpanership? I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, I, uh, it's good to be here. Um, and it's been really fun getting to collab with Insight and the Chimpers community. So yeah, I feel like I've, I've gotten a, a good crash course in chimpanership already. <laughs> Love to hear it. Um, I was just chatting with Insight before as well. He was kind of telling me a little bit about how you guys first connected and how you guys have been collaborating. Like, how did Chimpers first come across your radar and how did that kind of relationship start? I want to say it was the uh, Schiller crew, kind of uh, like Bernardo and Fungi um, that kind of, and TP that connected us. Um, and and they were basically, they indicated, hey, this community is really popping off. They're doing great. And during the lead up to Nifty Island's release, we were doing our best to try to identify every community that we should really go deep with and ensure uh, they have a good experience in the game and really put in a little extra legwork to make it happen. And so they said, yeah, Chimpers has to be on the list. And uh, and so we got chatting and I think right away, it was clear that uh, Insight and the team are really enterprising and saw a cool new platform and a new opportunity. And they put in some legwork, created some avatars, got their community going. And so, yeah, it just kind of flowed naturally from there. I definitely want to ask you more about what you just described. It's like that process of figuring out which communities to go for, because undoubtedly, and I was telling you before uh, the show this as well, like your launch uh, at the start of this year completely took over the timeline. So whatever process you went through, it went exceptionally well. So I definitely want to dive into that more later in the show. Uh, but probably want to start by going back into a bit of the history. Uh, but before we do that, just two bits of housekeeping for the audience. First, do please click the comment button in the right-hand corner and retweet the spaces so we can get as many people in here with all of us as possible. And finally, remember we have a POAP to collect later today. To claim today's POAP, you need to go to poap.xyz, uh, download the app and hit the mint button in the right-hand corner and just to prepare yourselves. Uh, after which you will need to enter a secret word, which we will reveal at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. Um, so Charles, let's get into it, starting with a little bit of the history. We were talking a little bit before the show as well. Nifty Island has like a long history. You're definitely not a new project, like just turning up shiny new Web3 <laughs> gaming project, of which there are many right yeah. now. Um, tell us a little bit about where the story started and how you've got to where you are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I've been doing stuff in crypto for a long time. Um, been pretty obsessed with it since, say, 2016 or so, and then was working in it full time since 2018. And I was an active contributor in the DeFi space and saw that ecosystem emerge really quickly and the and saw the way Ethereum was validated basically over the course of like six months. It went from being a chain that hypothetically could have dApps to one where there really were dApps. It was one it was a situation in which all these ERC20 tokens suddenly felt really significant and there was tons of infrastructure and many businesses built around them. And I saw how quickly that could happen. And so when NFTs started picking up and I was like trading CryptoPunks and doing stuff like in the kind of earlier days of NFTs, um, like before the board ape mint, before the big axie run up, was looking at this, saw the excitement around it, and kind of radically committed to the idea this is gonna be a big crazy asset class, a lot like how DeFi was, and then started to think from first principles around 
what are the things that need to be built for this to this asset class to make sense for a consumer to be able to confront it and understand what it is and have some uh, set of clear value props for why they should buy an NFT and what they should do with them once they buy it. So started thinking about that. And my co-founder and I basically came to the conclusion that gaming would play a really key role in how these NFT communities would develop over time. So we decided to build a platform that would give gaming utility to all of the communities that where they could all play. And, uh, and so then we, so we started off and that would have been, you know, really starting in like kind of April, late April, early May, 2021. And we basically pushed from there and embraced that it would take quite a while to build it and push through that bull market, through that, through the bear market, and then finally got it out uh, in January of this year. Amazing. What what gave you the foresight to think? Because I mean, I know Web3 Gaming right now is like a really big deal and a really hot topic. I, I've been in the space since early 21, late 2020 as well. I don't remember it necessarily being as big of a conversation there. Maybe it was, it was there in pockets, but not as much as it is now. What made you think back then to kind of have that leap to to, to recognize that potential trend? Yeah, so it, 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 you know, it existed under different names. So I think shortly after we began, you had the play to earn excitement. That, that kind of was a version of the Web3 gaming excitement. You had the metaverse wave as well. And these were all really ways of, describing the same thing with an emphasis on different elements of, of it. Um, and so I think for us, it was not obvious at the time to work on it. That being said, we thought there were really clear reasons from first principles to build a game world like this. So we looked at it and said, like, fundamentally, what are NFT communities and what are they trying to do? And really said that we said they're deep online tribes that use the internet in a different way that want to proliferate themselves. They want to attract new members. They want to drive up their floor price. They want to engage their core community. They want to create cool social content. And for us, we thought, okay, these deep online communities need more to do together. They need more. They can uh, need a platform they can leverage to achieve all of these goals. And an open game world seemed like the right thing to build. So we felt there was a strong reason from first principles to believe that NFT communities would want a game world to play in. And that maybe it just hadn't been built yet or hadn't been built in the right way. And then the other thing that we felt was that user generated content in games is the mega trend, like that games will be built by their players, not by, you know, a centralized dev team in the future. It's much like what we're seeing with YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. Ultimately, the tools for making video content have been democratized and it's it's just people can make their own content. And that is just going to be even more true into the future. I think if there's one mega trend you can count on, it's it's going to get a lot easier to make content of all kinds. And increasingly content, whether gaming or otherwise, will be made by the players. So we thought, let's build a new type of game world that leans into that trend mm. and can be accelerated by crypto. So really, it was kind of a two-part thesis. One, NFT communities are really interesting and a better way to use the internet. And they need a game world. And then on the other hand, it's user generated content is the future of gaming. And Web3 provides all sorts of ways of accelerating that trend and doing it in a new way. And so those two core assumptions were what we kind of believed in deeply and pushed based on. That's amazing. That's amazing to like recognize that trend back then or just to have that thought process and figure out that that's uh, the direction you wanted to go in. You mentioned you had like one co-founder, I think, one of the things when I've been having conversations with people when they're trying to start out in the space, um, it's incredibly difficult to do it alone. Like that's one mm -hmm. thing I've definitely learned in 2021 when I was completely alone in that kind of first cycle, it was very, very hard. Now in my second cycle, having yeah. like a close group of people with me and particularly like some business partners who, you know, you're, you're going to bat with every single day has made it so much easier. Who, who, who is your co-founder? How did you know them? How did you decide that you wanted to kind of take this venture with them? Yeah, so my co-founder goes by Zunk. Um, he is a friend, good friend of mine that I've known since middle school. Um, so we grew up in the same town in New England and we've known each other for a really long time. He is an engineer by trade, electrical engineer and a software engineer, largely self-taught. And he has been building indie games in his free time for a long time. And then has been sort of tangentially interested in crypto, but I kind of made that more of a thing for him as well by kind of like pulling him in and getting him excited about it. 
And so he's someone who's just always loved building software and other products. And okay. he's obsessed with, and he's also obsessed with making his own games and has been doing that for a long time. And, and so we kind of teamed up and, uh, and, and decided we'd, we'd jump in and, and push on this. Did you think this is what, a very interesting point when people are thinking about doing things from an entrepreneurial perspective, the importance of having someone with a technical background, and maybe you get a chance to speak to you, your background as well, whether that's something you know how to do. I personally, I'm not a technical person. My co-founder is also, he's, he's more technical than me, which is helpful, mm -hmm. um, but still not like a, a proper dev in any way. Like operating in this space, do you think it's like an essential thing for someone to have that technical perspective or at least have access to that as part of your founding team? I think it's all dependent on what you're trying to build. Um, I mean, there's people making like media companies and crypto that don't necessarily have any technical background. And, and I think that can work well. And I think probably where we're at and, and the space that we're trying to build in is this consumer crypto category where we've had a long period in which the dominant players in crypto have been building infrastructure. So. It's basically Vitalik creates Ethereum, and then there's been this sort of fractal set of Vitalik's where everyone's sort of trying to create their own infrastructure fiefdom within this broader crypto world. So it might be, you'd say Uniswap is maybe an example of this, or Arbitrum or Optimism, these sort of like attempts to, you know, say, let's build the next layer of infrastructure on top of Ethereum, um, or maybe even a rival blockchain to Ethereum. I think a lot of the focus has been infra and that's just inherently a very technical challenge. And so I think you've seen founding teams that are almost completely technical mm. uh, have the most success. But where we're at now, I think, is that is we have uh, finally a kind of lane for consumer crypto to succeed, which emerged when NFTs gained popularity. It became clear there are consumer products that people might want to buy sure. that are on chain. And, uh, and so now I think really what you want is, you know, a founding team that has a mix of like technical acumen to build the product, but also a deep understanding of the psychology around crypto and like what sort of products will actually resonate, what sort of incentives work, what do people really want in crypto? That's so I think right now you kind of need this blend. I think we're moving from the pure infrastructure founder to like a kind of more consumer oriented uh, cohort. Interesting. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I guess as the industry matures, there are more types of things that can be built on top of it, which facilitates like a, a greater diversity of person. I mean, maybe in some way, even I, me personally, like I'm an example of that. Like I wouldn't have been able to access crypto when it was pure, purely technical, but over mm -hmm. some time when it, when the kind of cultural layer came on top of it, it was like, okay, now I can I can kind of relate to some of that stuff. So definitely uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, so f from your personal perspective, like how do you see yourself fitting in there? Like, do you have that technical background as well? What's your kind of personal background? So I'd say I have, uh, I'm, I'm not like a software engineer by trade, but I've spent quite a lot of time around like in technical teams and, uh, like have some familiarity, but it's not my, like, I'm not like, you know, creating say like the next playground game on top of Nifty Island. It's not my focus. I think for me, what like I'm decent at is kind of understanding the space and maybe like what it needs and, and might, might, you know, might push it forward. And sure. then really, and then a lot of my focus too is on kind of thinking about the different stakeholders we have in our ecosystem and trying to deploy products that kind of stitch them all together in a novel way. So I kind of see what we're doing. I see crypto as like one big kind of system, almost like one big syndicate or company. And you have to try and build things that make it do new things that sort of cause people to coordinate in a cool new way and uh, that generates fun experiences. And so I guess uh, that's sort of my focus is I'm the person that's kind of marshalling the capital, the team, and kind of trying to chart a course for us to towards, um, you know, something that will work. Uh, that's, that's, that's my focus really, but I'm involved in a lot of product level stuff for sure. Super, super interesting. In terms of that kind of trajectory then, uh, from 2021, when you started out, I've learned a little bit about the background of you guys and, but you started in, I guess, a good market mm -hmm. Then it became a bad market. <laughs> then now it's a good market again, like in that first transition between the good and the bad, like 
what was the story there? Like, how did things progress for you guys and how are you thinking about things? Yeah. So I think we felt a real sense of urgency around jumping in and, uh, and getting going. Um, because again, like my seeing the way DeFi and kind of the whole ERC-20 token landscape evolved, it happened so fast. And a lot of big players were the ones that just happened to be there uh, at the beginning. So okay. we knew we had to move pretty quick to get involved. That being said, what makes this consumer layer of crypto a lot different than the DeFi one is that the products have a lot more surface area. They're really tough to build. So if you're building a big open game world, it's really hard. So I'd say the first bull market gave us an opportunity to try. Like people were willing to invest in us. People the people were willing to take a crazy bet on a team that says they're going to build this big game world. Um, and so we kind of pushed hard and knew we had to like be aggressive in that environment to even get a chance to be a part of this. So we did that, raised, raised, built up a team and pushed. And then we were very aware that this would all have to crash at some point. Not that we were perfectly prepared for it or we knew when, but we definitely knew like this is crypto. It's going to go up and then it's going to go down for a while and it's going to feel really bad when it's going down. Um, yeah. And so we were prepared for that, uh, but didn't, it doesn't make it easy. Uh, and, and our view basically was, OK, we we're building based on first principles. We think these NFTs are the future. And we just built through the bear market, kind of sticking to our guns, that these communities were important, that game worlds could be made better with crypto and just push through that period. Uh, and uh, yeah. And so I'd say, yeah, it's more or less it. We moved pretty aggressively in the bull market to martial capacity to build. And then during the the, uh, the bear market, we deployed, you know. Sounds uh, pretty well timed, I guess, in 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 hindsight. Yeah. When you, when you talk about kind of moving aggressively or moving quickly during a bull market, like what exactly does that mean? Like, is there an element to do with fundraising that's like, look, the market is good now. We have to do this now so that we have funds later. Like, how did you guys practically go about that? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things like, um, yeah, marshalling capital for sure, where like there's a window in time where people are really excited <laughs> about a new category and and yeah. and and really it is like who's bold enough to say, hey, we don't have it all figured out, but we're going to give it a go. Uh, and 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 so it was a combination of, yeah, like making sure to raise capital during that time. And then it was also kind of building the foundation of a community around the game. So we did that, too. We gave out some NFTs for free, our legendary palms, marshaled an early community of people who are excited about open game worlds and it was a group that wanted to build with us and wanted to help push it forward. So we've had that core community of OGs who have been around for a long time. I mean, it's almost three years uh, that they've been kind of involved in the game, contributing, testing, et cetera. So yeah, I think like in short, crypto is a lot about like projects become a shelling point for a certain narrative or idea. And, uh, and you've got to kind of get out in front and like be that or someone else will. And it's kind of arbitrary in a way who, people align around. So, you know, you need to move pretty quick and fly the flag for it while people are interested. Yeah, uh, I can see that. I think that makes sense. Um, what's your main learning from that period of time then? Like now that you've gone from, you know, the the difficult period into, sorry, the, the good period into the difficult period coming out into the good one now, if there's like a key reflection from that for other founders, like what, what's your key takeaway? Yeah. Um, let's see. I think a um, bunch of things. I mean, probably a key one is like you have to have really strong first principles reasons for why you're building what you're doing uh, to survive through the bear market and keep pushing through it. I think that's really important. Um, and I think there are different kinds of businesses in crypto. I think some are kind of these more like opportunistic, like fast follow kind of ideas where it's like sort of like, oh, this group did this. Let's like do something like that with a twist and see if we can get a token out. Right. There's a lot of that <laughs> uh, like that. that and that's if you're doing that, the rules are totally different for what sure. this, this advice probably isn't useful for you at all. So just ignore it. <laughs> but if you are interested in doing something where you're like, oh, we could build something like you look at like OpenSea or Uniswap or something like that. And you say like, wow, like these like unlocked huge new like category defining products. Yes. And I think more people should shoot for that in general, because I think there's, there's a lot of the short term stuff is fine. And some of it's kind of good. But 
Uh, but I think if you're trying to do something like category defining, yeah, you have to have really strong first principles reasons for what you're doing. And uh, you also need, and, and those should be rooted in an, an understanding of your end user. I think most of the places people get into trouble is when they don't have a strong kind of thesis for what they're doing. And even if they do, it's maybe rooted in like a theoretical user, like, oh, the Web2 gamers are coming, like they're coming tomorrow, don't worry, you know, and, and you, this is like an imaginary person that you're building for. Yeah. That's like the really bad situation to be in. So what you really want is like, you embrace, this is our, who, this is who's going to use the product. And here are like these um, key ideas we have around how we can give them something that's going to be like way better than what they've had before. Um, yeah. Super interesting. Did you have, I mean, it makes it sound all very methodical, all kind of really well thought out, but did you have any doubts? Like I know that because you mentioned two types of protocols in, in some respects and I, as, a, as a kind of angel investor now, I know what you mean when you say there are certain things that are raising and yeah. like they're raising, but you kind of look at the details. It's just like, well, that either already exists or I'm not really even sure about these terms or there's something, there's something not right about it. You think it's some kind of copycat thing, a quick, a quick pump in order to, yep. to get everyone's exit liquidity out. So yeah. Like how, how do you, how have you, how have you thought about that in this space and made sure that, uh, you're able to differentiate yourself from those other people. Like, how do you communicate that with investors uh, to make sure that you can stand like, you know, on your own aside from that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think uh, I like, so it's basically you have to communicate, like communicating kind of who you are and like what you're trying to do. And then, like attracting the right backers who are interested in backing something like you, because there definitely are plenty of people who are like, I want to invest, but like, if I can't get like liquidity in like two days, you know, mm -hmm. then it's uh, then this isn't really interesting for me. And that's like exactly what we were trying to avoid. Uh, sure. So I think for us, it was a, uh, like maybe like making it clear in the way you pitch and describe the project that it's rooted in deep convictions and that it's a really long-termist venture. And like, you're trying to define a category if possible. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, and then, and then I think like many investors are looking for that kind of thing and, and can feel it. And then in the way you structure terms, making sure that it is long-termist because there's an element of revealed preferences where if you say to someone like, Hey, like well, this could do really well, but it's not like a quick flip kind of thing. And it's yeah. clear in the terms that it's not you usually scare off people who, <laughs> you know, are looking for the quick flip. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a lot of that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I'd say that's, that's it. That's su super interesting. Uh, I can see how that, that plays out. Um, in terms of your, from, from a business perspective, and I want to get onto the game in just a moment, because I think that would be potentially what people are predominantly interested in. But one more thing on the business perspective, uh, in terms of like your KPIs, how did they kind of adjust when you were in the bear market into the bull market? Like what are your KPIs as a kind of category defining web three gaming platform? Yeah. So before we, so before we launched the thing we were trying to measure wasn't, you know, the performance of the product necessarily, cause it wasn't live. It sure. was more, it was more us looking at the market and saying like, you know, we had this hunch, Hey, NFT communities are robustly interesting. They are, a big attention center within crypto. Like they get tons of engagement on the timeline. They define the creator economy of crypto. Basically at this point, they've totally taken it over. Um, and, and so we were looking at this and saying, you know, if we are building a product that services them, which communities are most important to speak to. And so the main things that we were measuring during the bear market was we had this big chart that measured all the communities by Twitter engagement. And, uh, yeah, so we were looking at Twitter mentions on like a bar chart, basically, and we would okay. look at it, refresh it every day, every week. And we would try our best to surface ones we didn't know about and and not look at it. Our view was that like a lot of the floor price stuff is interesting, but it's sort of like kind of fake in a way, like or it's a little arbitrary. I completely and, agree. Yeah. Yeah, it just sort of is something's expensive because it's expensive. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes it's deserved, sometimes it's not. But we were looking at it and saying like, okay, let's look at all these communities and decide which ones are really hyped. And so there are a bunch or which ones we should work with that are not necessarily always the most hyped. They might be somewhat hyped, but they're also definitely the most active and want to play a game. So like a bunch come to mind, like 
alien friends throughout the bear market crushed it on Twitter, like consistently. Like if you look, measured the number of mentions of alien friends, it was always really high. And, uh, you know, it was giving things like Bored Ape a run for their money, right? Uh, like it was really a good amount of engagement. Um, this is really interesting. Like, what do you think the causes of this? And I, because th- I've reflected on this as well. And partly the reason why I reflected on this is because via this show, I've spoken to so many interesting founders from projects that might not necessarily see like the limelight as much in tradition. Well, I say traditional NFT media. NFT media hasn't really been around long enough to call <laughs> it that. But, you know, the, there are certain projects which get more limelight. I think that's pretty much confirmed. Definitely. But via this show, I've been interviewing some of the founders from maybe some of the projects that get less limelight. And the more you dig in, the more you realize there's like really, really strong communities, great engagement across the board. Uh, Two that come to mind like Killer Bears, Quirkies, who both of the founders who I've spoken to recently, like in your analysis, what do you think the reason is for certain people getting more limelight than others? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm just making a note that I should reach out to the Killer Bears guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, and I think Quirky's already have something in flight, so that's good. But yeah, very cool. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think there's kind of like a couple things going on. I think cri- crypto has this really competitive uh, kind of attention economy around it, mm-hmm. and um, and that's one dimension of what decides kind of who's considered the sort of like leading project. And then the other layer is there's this big world of like crypto capital and certain projects just become a shelling point for people to buy and mm-hmm. they t- and it becomes self-reinforcing, right? Like we've seen this where like a meme coin, when someone <laughs> buys in, it's bullish that someone else bought it. And so you should buy it. And then it's bullish that they bought it. So someone else is going to buy it. And then it just kind of flies up. And then suddenly like, you know, whiff is like a major asset, you know? And, uh, and it, so it's like, it's all very reflexive uh, and, it, and it really is about like, it's it, it just there's something arbitrary about it. So I think what happens is a bunch of projects could be like board apes or could be the thing that's like at the top and sometimes for good reason and sometimes kind of arbitrarily, a big wall of capital comes in and pushes it up in, in a reflexive way. And then suddenly they're considered dominant, but you have projects where the fundamentals could be just as strong um, but they just weren't the one that everybody arbitrarily piled into or, or, and it's sometimes, again, it's not arbitrary. Sometimes it's like, oh, there really is something going on here. Um, but so you've got lots of ones where like the floor price just kind of stays lower, but there's tons of community engagement. And I'll say one of my big goals with Nifty is because we're a platform that's like web three native and shows which communities are most active. I really want to try to flip the script on what is a blue chip, um, because okay. I think what we've what we've seen through our community leaderboards is that there are many projects that you don't that don't have like a twenty ETH or forty ETH or hundred ETH floor price, but they're very active and they're having a really fun time online. Like they're very much live communities, and so we want to keep surfacing that. Like if you look at our leaderboard right now, you can see like Niolings is extremely active. Uh, you, okay. We we could have told you that Sappy Seals were super active for the past like month and a half, two months, you know, before it ran up. Uh, so, it's so funny you say that, Charles, because I was speaking to, I think it was just on, on the timeline, but I was reporting on the seals yeah, and kind of just putting it out there that like, oh, I didn't really like, cause they, they experienced some huge surge in price and then Wab commented and I was just like, educate me, man. Like what's going on here? He was like, check out the, he actually said, check out the Nifty Island leaderboard yeah. and you'll find out. And I was like, okay, okay. Clearly something is going on there. Um, what, yeah. what, what, go on. Do you want to no, speak yeah, that? no, exactly. That's that's exactly. so. It's a. Uh, this is what's what's really interesting is. Um, I think we don't have good metrics for how active these communities are, and so all we have is the floor price. And so it's almost like imagine if you had like a bunch of companies with like a stock price, but nobody knew their earnings, and no one knew what the <laughs> you know nobody knew any other details, and so you would just sort of look at the stock price and be like, oh, this is you know worth a lot, therefore there must be good stuff going on, right? But you don't know whether it's like a castle made of sand, and. Uh, and when it comes to NFT projects, you basically have the floor price and then people don't know that much else. You have NFT inspect, which I think does a good job of giving us some color. I think it's one of the best products uh, in this regard. But I think what we can measure is the deep engagement, which is how many people will actually turn up to a platform, make content, play games, like earn prizes, do stuff. And the seals just uh, crushed it on that. A kid called Beast, Forgotten Runes, Azuki, Pudgy Penguins, also very strong. 
some smaller communities like Vipes or Nihilings or Misfit Pixels. There's a bunch that are that are strong too. That's um, amazing that you have that data. Like that data is incredibly valuable, I suspect. Um yeah. and really insightful that you get to that you get to see that. Um do you want to speak a little bit to kind of move towards the game now and like thinking about who who's on there and your vision for it? Like so ultimately Nifty Island, what what is the vision for it and uh how's it been kind of going so far from the top of the year? Because I know that there was the, your launch at the start of the year and you mentioned trying to get as many people in not being you know, being indiscriminate to the floor price just trying to get the most active people in it went really really well so what's the vision for nifty island and how how do you feel that launch went at the start of the year yeah so the the big vision for us is ultimately in like the very long term is to make a game world that rivals like a minecraft or a Fortnite or roblox and um that doesn't mean we think that'll be easy or that we're already there but that is the the long-term ambition is to make something that's like a really big platform that defines web3 gaming basically that like where it's 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 where you go to have a truly native web3 enabled experience in a high fidelity game world um and and, and so that's definitely that's the that's the goal there's a bunch and there's a bunch of things we're doing to achieve that i think critical to us is the game world is very different. It's than a Roblox or a Fortnite. It's this sort of short form UGC where anyone can make an island and share it on social media. And that island is like a customizable play space where you can do all kinds of things, play all kinds of games. So it's a pretty like different kind of game world and we want it to rival the big ones eventually. And, uh, and then the other thing that we're trying to do simultaneously, just going back to those kind of founding assumptions we had in making the project is that we want to play a defining role in how NFT communities engage with themselves, with others and grow and, uh, and socialize. So we're definitely, you know, trying to build more and more products around Nifty and, and, and uh, features mm. within the game world itself that will enable NFT communities to operate in a better way. So that uh, those are sort of the dual goals, you know, build a better kind of game world that can rival the big guys and build a game world that is like a platform that is uh indispensable to nft communities those are that's the sort of like the dual goals um and what was the second part of your question i feel like it was like yeah yeah the, okay. so the, the the launch uh that happened this year do you want to speak to uh its success really because it definitely completely took over the timeline for a, a week or two even right right yeah so the um yeah i think with that what we what went well is we got like the most vocal, super active, like NFT community participants in the game and got them familiar with the platform. Um, people have been retained at a really strong rate uh, who have come in and it's thousands of people playing it every day, which is great. And so I'd say where we're at is we're definitely not Fortnite, but we're, I would say pretty hard to argue that it's not like Fortnite within Web3, you know, which is a, a smaller yeah. group, but it is, uh, we definitely have, I think, achieved that status. And then the goal from here is how do we take this super vocal group of users and empower them to grow the game far more beyond Web3? I think everybody's looking for that like Web3 to mass consumer crossover. Our goal is make something that's so useful and irresistible to the Web3 crowd uh, and that empowers them to onboard new users and bring lots of people in. Because I really think what NFT communities are is they're basically big tribes of creators, like people who want to be vocal on Twitter who want to kind of contribute to this collective effort. And we want Nifty to kind of set them loose to say like, you know what, maybe we can get like, uh, you know, a thousand new Forgotten Runes fans or 10,000 or 100,000 more partially by leveraging Nifty. That's that's the goal. So, you know, first it's been, you know, be the game world for Web3 and then it's kind of arm the Web3 world with tools to, you know, spread beyond uh, into the mainstream with by using the platform. I want to ask you about one of the challenges that I, I would see see for this as an outsider, because I think, I mean, I think internally each project has its own challenge of trying to get engagement, to try to keep their holders activated and keep them interested. But I guess your challenge is almost infinitely greater in the sense that you want to help the other communities onboard their people and kind of work together with all of them at the same time. Like, is, is, is this a challenge I'm making up or like, how, how are you finding it working with so many communities trying to get them to be active in, in your 
uh, gaming world, whereas I'm sure they have their own problems in their own way, like just oh, trying no. to get their own people active. And but you've got like tenfold problems, right? Because you're working with ten communities, they're just working with one. So, like, how, how have you managed that? Yeah, this is a really delicate one, um, and I think. We had to try to approach this, you know, knowing that every project, every community is the, the center of their own world, right? Yeah. And uh, and you got to kind of embrace that perspective and try to build something that's a pure no brainer value add, not something where it's like, hey, do you want to do this side quest that kind of like distracts <laughs> from the main thing you're doing? Yeah. Um, that 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 was really important and to like approach it knowing that these guys have other things on their mind. Um, and and so I think part of it was. We, we, we kind of framed the whole thing as a no brainer where we're like, Hey, all we need is an avatar. We may even make you an avatar in the early days if you want. Okay. So you've got an avatar in the game world, your community can farm an airdrop by participating. And the nature of the game world is such that we're not asking the core team to manage anything at all. They don't have to do anything. Like they don't have to build an Island. They don't have to do any. There's nothing they really have to do. Maybe tweet would be nice. And that's about it. And so, uh, it, it, what it does is it sets their holders loose to engage in this cool world together, but it doesn't ask the team to do anything. So, so that was the key key. The key uh, was to not ask too much. Yeah, exactly. Like my, my view is like the shit, the big, the most we could ask is like, let people know that this is an option. Right. Uh, and then if they get excited by it, what we've seen since is community project teams have seen value in it. And so there've been deeper collabs. Like we did the seal generated content competition with uh, them. We've done tons of events and quests. And so people people are into it now and are down to do more and invest more effort and time. We've seen you know teams build islands, teams build big 3D asset libraries, do their own prizes and incentives. Like we've seen a bunch of that, but at least on day zero, it was important that it felt like a complete no brainer where it's sort of like, hey, you're, all your holders can enjoy a game world and farm an airdrop. Mind tweeting about it maybe a couple of times. And then people are like, yeah, I could do that. That seems reasonable. Not like, hey, we need you to build your own custom island and we're going to need you to manage every day and spend your entire life trying to, you know, deal with this platform. We wanted it to be something where they could just kind of say, sure, and, and it would work. I've got an important question on this from an entrepreneurial perspective, because I think, look, when, when you're trying to ask things of people, it's difficult to know when to like let people go and be like, look, I can't change their mind. They're just going to say no versus, you know, pushing a little bit harder to try to convince them. What was your kind of read on trying to convince people versus just like, okay, they didn't respond too well. I'm just going to let that one go work on the next person. Um, yeah. What's that? Um, I think, uh, I think hmm, we, we had some, so when we were in the kind of like pre-launch bear market period, we had some communities that just really got it and were really interested, you know, right okay. away, which is great. Like forgotten runes is one, like a kid called beast is another, there were others as well who were just sort of like, yep, I totally get it. This is really cool. Uh, I could see this working. Like, let's, let's talk about it. Um, and that was great. And then with people who were maybe like a little more skeptical or kind of busy, uh, I thought that was good feedback too, because it made us realize like, you know, okay, we need to frame, like, this is where we arrived at the idea. This has to be a bit of a no brainer. You know, it has to be like really easy to say yes to. So, um, and it also has to be that their holders are interested in it because in the end, like projects respond to what their holders are excited about. So it's like, if you can generate bottom up enthusiasm, then, they'll be like, yeah, people want to do it. Sure. But what they don't want to do is have to go out on a limb and, you know, suggest something people don't necessarily want. So, uh, so yeah, I think like, you know, we just, we just followed where the enthusiasm was and we were lucky that groups like, Oh, cyber Kongs is another, like they were really into it from like the beginning. And so we just kind of followed the enthusiasm and then built from there more or less, but we had to accept that some people weren't going to be interested at first for sure. Yeah, I think that can be tough for people for for any kind of entrepreneur to deal with sometimes when people don't don't necessarily receive whatever news you have uh, too well. But I guess you probably had enough feedback to know that you were going enough positive feedback to know that you were going along the right lines. Um, I think that's good. Uh, so a fi maybe a final question before I ask some more personal questions about the game, though. Like, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on in the game at the moment that you'd love for pe love for people to know about? Yeah. Um, with, when it comes to yeah, kind of big, like exciting, like exciting stuff down the line. Um, let's see. Well, we will have more for people really soon. Uh, that's going to be really okay. like growth oriented. So 
I definitely would say for people playing now, like you are, if you're playing now, you're like the enthusiast users that are kind of like feeling it out and, and are people who, you know, will have a chance to benefit from the growth of the game going forward. So, uh, so I think that's important. Like just overall, like I think we've taken the approach that it's like build a great product, get in, in enthusiast, hardcore users, and then enable them to grow with us. And so that's where we're at is we're kind of on the eve of like our kind of beginning of our growth push. Um, so that that's kind of cool. I think people should be aware of that that context. But I guess what I'll say in terms of like the long term vision for this thing, I mean, I think like eventually it should be that you can play an infinite number of games on your island. Like this, your island is this like really crazy game space where all kinds of games can be played. Um, where it's not just like three or four playground games; it's like a ginormous library of them. And so that that I think is really fun and uh, will be cool. Um, uh, I think other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe that that's a, that's about it. Like the game is going to get like hyper varied and surprising. We're about to go into a big growth push, um, and yeah, that's about Very it. Very exciting. Yeah, Very exciting. Like, yeah. What, 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 one more, just on that while we're there. Like, I think one of the things that founders have found a lot of pressure recently is either any something to do with their own token, or now even it seems to be the case that founders are under pressure to like go out and get other people's tokens and attract uh, that kind of attention towards them. Mm -hmm. uh, how have you found the balance between like token conversations and growth conversations and product conversations? Like how do you strike the balance when you're putting your message out there uh, to people? Yeah, um, I, think, um, I think we always focus on like the thing we're trying to create together like the like I, I basically think there's like a big vision there's like we can build this really big crazy new kind of game world that changes crypto and really enhances what it means to be in an nft community that that is like the big vision and then we're usually just very realistic about where we're at with it you know where we're like that's we're going to this big crazy place but like we generally are just like but here's where the game is at now and the good news is the game is further along than most things. So it's, uh, I'd say, so, so it's a good, good, so it's good. Like we can be realistic and it's still positive. Um, so I think it's like, you know, and then I think that the token is just an extension of the, the vision of the project really. Like I just see it as like, it's part of the product. It's part of the ecosystem we're building. Mm. And, and for me, like when I look at the token, the goal is to get it in the hands of people who really like the product. And I think what you see with tokens, especially as the bull market ramps up is, you'll have tokens where like, there's literally almost no one who holds it, who believes in it, you know, mm -hmm. pretty much nobody is like, damn, I'm like, I, I'm going to hold this thing forever. Like I, have to, I actually really believe in this thing. Whereas the bull market picks up, you have basically token communities where there's like, nobody's not trying to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's trying to sell it at some point. Uh, and, uh, and so what I like about the way we've approached the play to airdrop stuff is I really think we can have a uniquely kind of passionate and like bought in, like token holder community that's like yeah i'm like really excited to hold island token because it it makes me a part of this crazy game world that i think could be huge over the coming years and, and i think we will have that as like a unique thing is that our community is like all aligned around where we want to take the game and they are all aligned on where it's actually at right now like there's no kind of mystery like what will it be when it launches like you know it's it's the people who will hold island token for the most part are people who like I put skin in the game and are really like, you know, believers in what we're doing. So, yeah. Um, so we, the token matters. It's, it's the glue that holds us all the thing together, but it's, uh, it's ultimately just part of the vision and part of the, what we're trying to do together. Got it. I think that makes sense. It's like deeply integrated into the broader vision rather than being the main reason uh, to participate yeah. in yeah, any way. I, it can become for certain projects or the way they try to present it. Exactly. I was saying this the other day, but to me, like the, I think one of the best measures of a token is whether it, its existence stimulates new activity and new behavior. That's like actually like productive and cool. Uh, I think the kind of worst types of tokens are where you have a product and then there's a token and the token has like almost nothing to do with the product, you know, but it's like a thing that will like kind of that some people hold because, and, and then have really like, kind of maybe like they're they just like product do something to make the token go up you know it's, it's like they're very separated like the people who hold the token don't use the product and the token itself the trading of it the activity around it doesn't really affect the product they're just completely separate that's the sort of thing i didn't want to build uh 
And instead, the way I view it is like, you know, it, take like a chain link Marine, right? Like link is like, it has this passionate community. Like I see Island Token as like, what if chain link, what if you had a community as passionate as that, but they have tons of stuff to do together, you know, to further the, the, the cause like that, that is way more, that's like really powerful. So, and I think what you'll see with Island Token is it's motivating people and it, and it will motivate communities to all support the same platform. It's basically what is turning Nifty Island into a public good filled with really like devoted creators and like a really kick-ass player base. So yeah, I think that's the ultimate measure of a token to me is does the token actually motivate cool new coordination, cool new behavior? Uh, or is the token just kind of like a separate thing that goes up and down that has nothing to do with the product, right? Like that's the that's the measure of it for me. Okay. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think that makes sense to me. Um, we touched a little bit on like what uh, people uh, find challenging. Well, from a more personal perspective, uh, kind of being a co-founder in this space, people talk about it being like an incredibly challenging role. Like mm -hmm. what are some of your personal reflections, personal learnings of like how to be a co-founder in this space? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most critical things, the thing that makes it unique, and I think when people look back on this space, it's what they will say was weird about it. And like, you know, and I hope that somewhere it gets cataloged how weird it has been, because <laughs> I feel like nobody has time to write it down, right? But uh, the uh, but it's basically the cyclical nature of it is uh, really challenging and unique, like where, yes, there have been like a dot-com bubble and crash, like, there were railroad, you know, bubbles and, and crashes like every new industry has had this dynamic. But crypto is so cyclical. I mean, it's like it it is uh, like we have these like two, three year cycles and it just like absolutely tears and then it crashes and it does it over and over again. Uh, and it, seen, it doesn't show any signs of stopping. Perhaps <laughs> perhaps it will chill out a little bit, but um, yeah. that's really hard. And I think the way you manage those cycles is uh, the unique challenge where it's sort of like during a bull market, the temptation is to take on tons of leverage and like hidden ways. So it could be anything from over hiring or, you know, uh, or, or maybe like putting your project treasury in a meme coin or like, you know, uh, or, um, or even just like being a little bit too like fast and loose and like, maybe not like being nice enough to people, you know, like people just getting, on getting overconfident, getting out sure. again, you, you can feel it, right. You can feel it when people, yeah, even even on a personal level, sometimes when you're trading, suddenly you start to feel like you're a good trader just because all the market is up. It's like exactly. you've got nothing to do with this sometimes. Sometimes it's just the market, right? Exactly, man. Exactly. And so you've kind of got this period of like, you know, your even bad ideas look like good ideas. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and it's like trying to like stay focused on the right things during that period while still leveraging the fact that there's a lot of excitement is really hard. And then you've got the bear market where even good ideas look like bad ideas. That's and uh, well. yeah, and and all the bills that you've racked up come, you know, are come as, come calling basically, and and so I think that cyclical nature of things is with crypto is like the most unique, difficult psychological game that mm -hmm. most startups like. If you're doing a SaaS business, like you're like, oh, we're trying to make like trucking a little more efficient, like there would be cycles, but you wouldn't be <laughs> it wouldn't be that crazy. You'd be <laughs> like, you'd just be like, yep, we're doing the same thing we were doing last year. Whereas in crypto, it's like it's like you know, take a the same project two years apart and like the idea could look genius or like extremely dumb, you know? Yeah. <laughs> on, and at, uh, one, at one point in time you could think, right, let's go for this. It's great. Another point in time you'd be like, no, we need to press pause and hold, like hold off for a, a huge period of time. Cause there's nothing going on. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. People just mothball things too. Yeah. People be like, okay. all right, time to stop doing crypto for a little while. Uh, it's, it's really AI. Weird. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank God that's over. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's good. That that's done um <laughs> look, i'm very conscious that we only have four minutes left so maybe a final question then we need to get this po app into the hands of our listeners too like we've spoken a lot about personal reflections team reflections spoken a lot about the game if you had to advise someone who's like what is passionate about this space wants to get involved wants to do something entrepreneurial like with all of your experience now what would be your advice to them yeah, in crypto specifically, doing something entrepreneurial or just general? Yeah, in crypto, in Web3, with NFTs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, let's see. I mean, a couple things. Like, I think um, 
you, I think you should love what crypto actually is. I guess that'd be my biggest advice. Like the projects that confuse me the most or where I'm like kind of the most, like, I'm not sure what to like, what to do here is if people don't actually love what crypto is, which is like, it's about like people being extremely online. It's about people really liking these deep online communities. And it has a huge speculative dimension to it. I think like, if you want to build a product in crypto, you should love crypto and love what it is. I think there's a lot of talks of like kind of bemoaning what it is like, oh, no, like meme coins, you know, how, how could this be, you know, or something? <laughs> it's like it's like, well, that's what it is. So I don't know what to tell you. Like, that's a huge part of what it is. Uh, uh, and so I think like, for anyone wanting to build in crypto, the bull market approaches, a lot of people find it attractive. And it kind of is all done up in like a lot of makeup essentially during the bull market. And then the bear market comes and people are like, oh, maybe this was all pretty regrettable and I shouldn't have <laughs> spent my life doing this. I think if you're going to build in crypto, you should love crypto and like love what it actually is. And uh, and if you don't, you shouldn't uh, build in it. That'd be I actually love that. I, was, I, I love that perspective. Um, on some level, I've started to reflect like, am I a little bit crazy? Like one of the things that happened is I started calling other people crazy for being in the space or like, oh, this space is so crazy. But then yeah. equally you need to look at yourself in the mirror like, well, maybe I'm a little bit crazy as well. And maybe I enjoy being here, but yeah. you have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy the roller coaster a little bit because that's what it is as well. So I, I kind of uh, second that idea. Um, look, this has been a fantastic discussion, Charles. Uh, we're unfortunately running out of time for today's show. So let's get the perp into the hands of the people and we'll get your details out there for people who want to follow along with, to you and Nifty Island in just a moment. Uh, as mentioned, this perp is designed by Timpers himself, includes our special guest, Charles himself. And you can access it in just one moment. Before we get that perp to you, just want to shout out one more time our sponsor for season two, who is Cedify, the big player in the gaming world. They're not just another name in the game, they're leading the pack with the highest market cap in the game launchpad scene. They're cooking up something huge with SeedWorld, a virtual universe set to shake up the Web3 user-generated content space. Right now, they've got two killer NFT collections, Mounts and Vanguards. Only 3,110 and 6,000 of those NFTs exist. So if you're up for staying ahead of the game, now the time's time to get involved. We're super excited and hyped to have them as our Chimpreneurship partner. You can join the SeedWorld community by picking up the NFTs on your favorite ETH marketplace right now so back to today's poap claim you need to go to poap.xyz and we are perfect on timing here it's going to be live in just one minute download the app hit the mint button in the right hand corner after which you need to enter the secret word today which is bloom b l o o m all lowercase b l o o m all lowercase that is the password the secret word for you to collect your pap next week will actually be the final episode for the Chimpreneurship Series 2. So we'll be doing the raffles for the Chimpers, for the people who've been collecting their POAPs. So hopefully see you in next week's episode two. If you have any issues with your claim, you can jump into the Chimpers Discord and raise a ticket and someone from the team will be able to assist you quickly. Um, so thank you again uh, to the Chimpers founders for making this possible. Thank you to our sponsor, Seedworld, and a very special thank you to our guest, Charles, for joining us. That was one of my favorite conversations that I've had so far. Charles, where can we go to keep up to date with all things Charles and Nifty Island on top of that? Yeah, they're basically the same thing. So uh, <laughs> uh, Nifty underscore Island on Twitter, for sure. Give a drop it a follow. And then there's my Twitter too. Um, yeah, uh, so definitely definitely check that out as well. Yeah, Charles, but the ease of three, B-I-I. Uh, yeah, so check that out. Definitely do that. And guys, just to reiterate, uh, Nifty Island completely took over the timeline. And I definitely concur that the engagement on it has been absolutely insane. Go check out Charles. Go check out Nifty Island if you haven't already. Uh, very, very excited to see what they are cooking up over the next weeks and months. Uh, that's the end of the show, guys. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again, Charles. We will see you next week. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye.